brought to you from Melbourne, Australia. This is the Badminton Podcast, a community for badminton players by badminton players, where we talk badminton, celebrate local heroes, interview players from all walks of life, and push you to grow as a player and a person. Introducing your hosts, Jeff and Henry. Welcome to the Badminton Podcast. I'm Jeff. And I'm Henry. And we're the co-founders of Volant Wear, and we're here because we love badminton. Thank you for joining us. We're so excited to be here with the next episode of our podcast. If you want to find out more about what our podcast is about and why we started, please listen to our introduction episode. Today, we have a very special guest. And by special guest, I mean my co-host, Jeff. Jeff is the former Australian number one men's singles player from 2008 to 2014 and a two-time Commonwealth Games athlete. He has also represented Australia on multiple occasions at the biggest and most prestigious badminton tournaments in the world, such as the World Championships, Sudeman Cup, Thomas Cup Finals and All England Championships. He is also, as you might expect, my business partner and co-founder of Volant Wear. Outside of badminton, Jeff is a dentist, a dental business coach, and a demonstrator at the University of Melbourne. He just got back from Switzerland as he was coaching the Australian team at the 2019 World Championships. And today, we'll be recapping on his experience. Thank you for being here, Jeff. Thanks, Henry. It's it's funny to be on the show, but being a guest as well as a host at the same time. So it's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it. So, Jeff, for some of our audience, I would expect that they are badminton players. Some might be badminton fans and some might be neither of those. So when we talk about the world championships, I think it's hard for most people to understand what that's really like. And for me personally, I've only been to a couple of professional level tournaments and I feel like the atmosphere was incredible. So for you, how was the World Championships and what was it like being in that kind of environment? Henry, it was absolutely awesome. And I don't just mean that in a kind of a downplayed sense. It is actually phenomenal to be part of the professional badminton circuit again. It's been about... 11 years since I've been training full-time and playing full-time. I have played in international tournaments since then, but I've really found that the environment there with all the top players there, the coaches, the training that happens before and during the tournament in itself, the professionalism and just basically the atmosphere and the environment, all the players coming together is something that's really, really special. And it's something I can't really describe in words other than it being special. It's kind of a feeling that you get. And it did really bring back memories from when I was training and I was playing a lot. And just being part of it, it, you just feel like you're part of a different world. You're there and everyone's got the same goal and that's to perform as best as they possibly can. No one thinks about anything other than badminton and it's phenomenal. And the level of play, of course, because it is the World Championships, is amazing as well. And it was so good to be there seeing live badminton again at the highest level. Yeah, great. From the sounds of it, Jeff, it would be an incredible experience whether you're a badminton player, a fan, or not even either of those because it would just be such an incredible environment. And being in Basel, is it Basel? I forget how to pronounce it. I, I call it Basel, but Basel? I, think, okay. I think in German it's called Bale or something. I'm oh, not okay. too sure. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, so being in Bale or Basel in Switzerland uh, would be a very different experience as well, taking you on, on the other side of the world just for a a completely different world. So in terms of your experience there, I'm sure based on your experiences as a badminton player, you have experienced many different types of tournaments before as a player, but what was it like as a coach? Being a coach was vastly different than being a player. I've been to Basel or Bale or whatever you want to call it. I've been there twice before. And just while I talk about the pronunciation of it, I'm not 100% sure, but when you actually land at the Basel Airport, it's really funny because there's two entrances. One entrance says to France, 
and okay. one entrance so one exit says to france and the other exit says to switzerland it's really strange because it's right on the border of switzerland france and germany so you can literally just move just a li- not too far away and you're in a different country so that was a really funny experience because we were looking at where to get picked up for the hotel transfer and we were looking at the signs and we're thinking hmm, we're going to switzerland right we're not going to france so that was a really fun experience from a coaching perspective It is completely different in the mindset compared to being a player. So being a player, you're there to perform yourself. So you do what you need to do yourself. You don't really worry about the things going around you and everything is done for you per se. So the training sessions are organized for you, the transport is organized for you. And that's fair enough because as a player, all you need to be spending your time and energy on is training, preparing for your matches, playing your matches and then recovering and getting ready for the next match. So what I found was coming from a coaching perspective, it's so different because you're a lot about service. So you're serving the players, you're serving the players. Hey, what do you need? What training do you need? I think we should do this. I think we should do that. We should recover this way. We should eat here. We should train at this time, all these kinds of things. The perspective is a lot greater. So it's a lot broader. You have to take a step back and see what's best for all players and not just for one individual player. Of course, each individual player has their own needs that you need to cater for, but that in the grand scheme of things, you're kind of over everything and everyone from both a coaching perspective and a managerial perspective. So if I was going to break it down in a few little elements as to what was the main differences, the first one is it's very team focused rather than the individual focus. Of course, when we're looking at Uh, When we're coaching the actual matches, of course, it's individually focused for the match itself as well as the preparation for it. But the mindset, like I said, is very much team orientated and seeing what's best for the team and what's going to work the best for everyone. The second is that the amount of time you spend at the stadium is crazy. I'd spend at least 12 hours at the stadium each day. And that was one, to help train the players, to spar with them as well. Two, to basically coach the players, make sure they're ready before the matches coach during the match, talk to them after the matches. And three, also to go for things like managers meetings, make sure we've got everything covered off, arrange transport, arrange training sessions for the players, and then go and get the video footage for the matches that we've just played or the matches we need to play against like the opponents for tomorrow. Because at the tournament there, they didn't allow us to record the matches ourselves. They recorded it for us and then we had to go and request for the videos, which was really handy. It made my job a lot easier as well because I do remember when I was a player, the coach running around and trying to get the video camera behind all the necessary matches. So that's the second thing. So you just you just have to be at the stadium for a really, really long time. And the third thing is you have so many different things you need to do. So you're a coach, so you need to help technically, you need to help at training, you need to help with video analysis, you need to help with recovery. And then you're kind of like the organizer as well. So you have to organize the players, make sure they're at the pick up location at the right time so no one misses the bus or no one misses the tram because we're taking the tram there scheduling training sessions making sure everyone can get there because not everyone was staying at the same place as well organizing things like pick up of shuttles otherwise we're gonna have shuttles for training and extra transports there's so many different things that you don't you as a player you know that they do happen but you never worry yourself about them but as a coach and as the manager there that's all you think about. All you think about is what do I need to do next for the players? What do they need tomorrow? What do they need the next day? And make sure you've organized it well in advance. That's great, Jeff. That Thank you for those insights. They are very interesting. And it certainly seems like a challenge to juggle all those things at once. And I do want to come back to your particular role at the World Championships and dive deeper into that. But I think what might be on some of the audience's mind is did you actually go to the three different countries at the airport no no, i didn't i only took the exit to switzerland i do remember in 2000 and it would have been 2007 when i was first in basel we had a training session on court and then we did a bit of a recovery jog and what we actually did was we jogged across the german border so we i can technically say that i ran to a different country so that was pretty special, but we didn't actually do that this time. Okay, it's a shame. <laughs> it's a shame. I was I was excited that you would probably tell me that you went to three countries within the space of five minutes, but <laughs> unfortunately not. Not quite. No. 
Anyway, back to back to juggling your role as a coach. Can you please tell me what it's like to manage the expectations of the various players and their needs and still be able to make sure that everyone is happy, they, they get what they need, but you're still managing their expectations because you may not be giving them what they want at that particular time. That is the hardest thing probably about the, the coaching part of it and coaching the entire team. And that is, like you said, Henry, to make sure you cater individually for what each individual needs, but also have the team in perspective as well. What I really noticed during my time there was that <laughs> players can be very demanding and very selfish. And I don't doubt that I was like that as a player as well, because you're there to perform and you do everything you can to perform. So if you need something, you ask for it and that's it. So what I found was that generally speaking, I could accommodate for the request, requests of most people. So if they requested something, I'd be able to space out a time, for example, before every single match, I would spend time by myself reviewing the matches. So reviewing the opponents that they're playing and having a few things that I want to speak to the player about. And then I would get the player to actually watch it themselves alone and note down what they think and then would come together the day before the match and then would basically work out a game plan and maybe two, three or four things that they need to focus on as a game plan thing. And that was very demanding time-wise because there was a lot of matches to prepare for, but that was something I was able to cater for. Some things that I weren't able to cater for were one, training sessions, because everyone had different matches. So everyone had matches at different times. So I couldn't have a training session where everyone could turn up to as well. And the tricky thing about it is because there are so many countries playing and there's only so many practice and training courts available, each day I'd put my request in for the training venue and the courts, but the chances that I actually get the exact request that I wanted was very low. So we had to work around those training sessions. So there were some sessions where some players couldn't attend just because they hadn't come in yet or they were playing at that time or other reasons. And that was something I just had to manage to make sure that we... We still got as much on court time as we possibly could within the boundaries and within the restrictions of the availability of the courts as well. So all in all, I'd say it's definitely something that's achievable, but at the end of the day, it is something that I've had to make a call a couple of times and say, hey, we're doing it this way and sorry, but this is the way we're doing it. And that's just the way it is. Sometimes you just can't please everyone, but I think that a lot of the players understand. So once I explain to the players why I've made this choice or why this has happened this way, and because of that, the understanding comes through and they don't take it personally or anything like that, they do understand the bigger picture of things and me trying to serve the team as a whole. It certainly sounds like a challenge and there's a lot of contributing factors to being able to manage all those players and all their requests, but it sounds like you've done a very good job at it. Obviously, I'm I'm listening as a third person and wasn't there myself as a player, so I can't speak for them, but it certainly sounds like you managed to get around um, these issues fairly well. I haven't gotten any complaints or anything like that, and the players did ask me whether I was going to do more tournaments and more coaching with them, so that hopefully is a good sign, or they were just being nice and respectful. But, uh, we'll, we'll wait and <laughs> but see. Haven't heard any bad feedback yeah. as of yet. Well, I sincerely hope to see you coaching them again. And I take it you were on TV as well. Yes, yeah, so I was on TV. I was on the TV court, I believe, twice during the time there. One, one of the times was for mixed doubles, and we came through with a victory in three sets. And then one was for ladies' singles, which we unfortunately we didn't win that. I'm not sure. We might have been on for a ladies' doubles as well. Yes, I do believe we were on for a ladies' doubles, but unfortunately we didn't uh, mm -hmm. win that. We were against the top seeds then, which was... Difficult for a second round, second round ma match. Mm. So I did get some TV time. I got a few messages from home. Some people, I played badminton last night and some people that I ran into said, hey, I saw you on TV. Some people took some screenshots and sent it to me and did some little annotations on my nose like there was boogers coming out my nose and things Fantastic. like that. But all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah. But it was fun to be on TV. And look, it didn't change the way I was coaching. Uh, I just did what I normally do. 
it was a bit strange to have a camera looking at you straight in the face when I could see it in the corner of my eye when I was coaching that there was a camera facing me. And then I did notice that they were looking at my notes. So I did write some notes while I was coaching just so I'd remember what to say to the players in the intervals. And there was a close-up of my notes, so I'm not sure how the commentators viewed that, but hopefully they weren't too mean when they <laughs> when they saw my notes. But we won that match, so maybe maybe they were the right notes. <laughs> well, maybe they were. Just to change gears for a moment, and we, you did touch on it a little bit about the results, so... How did Australia do in this tournament? So the Australian players, I believe, we put up a really good fight. Look, the World Championships are basically what the World Championships mean. They're the world's best players, and it is such a prestigious and coveted title that everyone there is there to win. I'm not saying that in other tournaments they're not there to win, but the World Championships is often what players will peak towards. And by peak, what I mean is they arrange their training schedules and their training loads and everything in a way that they can perform at their very best at this tournament. Because it's not actually physically possible to play at your peak at every single tournament, just purely based on the fact that your body needs to recover, you need to have training periods so you're in peak physical condition. Of course, you want to be as good as you possibly can be but the training around it will often make it so that you are physically fresh and fit and and ready to go for that particular tournament so world championships is like that because it's so big and it's it means a lot and there's lots of ranking points to be gained which is so important in this olympic qualifying period as well so all in all i do believe that the australian players we did play very well and we do still have a lot of things to work on So with regards to the results itself, I believe that for all the matches that we had a good chance of winning, that we actually did come through with a victory. We were a bit unlucky with one of the men's doubles matches. Unfortunately, we didn't get through that and there was an opportunity there. Uh, But for all the other matches, I do believe that what we could have done, we did. And although I would love to see our players beat the, the top pairs, the really high seeded pairs, It would have been great if they could win, but it would have been a big upset if they actually did win those matches. So they did fight hard through it, uh, but there's so much learning, there's so much progress that we we need to do as, as, as the players and as a country as a whole. Yeah, okay. So let's say your Australian team members were listening to this podcast, and I hope that they will be listening to this podcast at some point. If you could tell the team as a whole, and I know it's hard to generalize advice and generalize ways that the whole team can improve but if you could give them some advice as to how you how they could bridge that gap between those top level players these world champions what can they do first of all if anyone from the team is listening which i hope you are um, first of all thanks for an awesome trip it was a great trip a great experience for me and i hope you got a lot out of it because i did and i really did enjoy giving you the best that I possibly could during that time as well. In general, I would say that the, the, the area that we're most lacking in is probably match play. And what I mean by match play is playing matches and playing and training at that really, really high level. Unfortunately, a lot of the time, because in Australia we don't have the depth of players as... We don't have the same depth of players that the other countries do have what we find is the level of match play that we actually have at our training sessions isn't as high. And so what we find is because our match play isn't as high, our pace isn't as high as well, so it's harder for us to keep up. So if you think about it this way, let's just say a top player's normal speed of the play is 8 out of 10, for example, and our speed of play is only 6 or 5 out of 10. That means that in order for us to compete with them, we're trying to compete at 8 out of 10 level. And because we're not used to training at that level, we get fatigued very quickly. Or else because the top players, their default speed is 8 out of 10, they can play like that all day. So what I found in the matches where we play the top players is we can definitely compete with them. It's just that we can't compete with them for long enough to be able to win the match because they can just outplay us. They can play us for longer. 
Um, so I think the biggest thing for our players is to just try to get as much match play as we possibly can at a higher speed, at a higher level. And sometimes that might not be really possible because sometimes we don't have that many people to train with. But if we can get sparring partners, even if we play two versus one singles or two versus one or three versus one or three versus two, anything where we're putting ourselves under more strain, pressure, pushing our speed, all those kinds of things, those things are definitely going to help. So number one takeaway from me isn't that our players aren't fit enough. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that they're not fit enough at that high intensity. So we need to try to increase our default intensity. So rather than six or five out of 10, if we can get it up to that eight out of 10 for our default intensity so that we can play like that all day for a sustained period of time, that's where we're gonna start seeing results. Great, Jeff. I think that's really valuable advice. I know it's going to be very challenging to implement, especially in a country like ours. Uh, without the level of uh, players that exist in those top level countries out there. Yeah, exactly. Unfortunately, because we don't have that depth of players and those numbers, it's tricky for us to have people to train with all times because people live in different areas. If you look at the top countries, what they would, what you'd find is within one small area, they would have say 10 singles players of about the same caliber or level or even more. So there's so much variety. There's so many people to play against and they're so accessible. Whereas say in Australia, let's just say we do have 10 people at the same level at a higher level. They might be spread across Australia from Sydney to Melbourne to Brisbane to Perth, Adelaide, everywhere. And it's so hard to get everyone together to train so that they can feed on each other. And that's that's what the, the top countries do. They do have that depth and that number of players and at training as well so they've got national teams they've got backup national teams they've got sparring players they've got so many resources accessible to them that helps them push their level at all time just an example tai su ying she has a sparring partner that she just pays so the sparring partner is her coach as well so basically the sparring partner will train with her so she's basically playing men's singles against her sparring partner that's her training so no wonder she can compete at such a high level because she's been always pushed at that to that level. So when I see them at training, the sparring partner is the coach. And at training, even the day before the match, he's pushing her really, really hard. And that's because she can sustain it. She's not going to get tired just from that one training session because she's got that much depth, that much base in her fitness that she can train really hard the day before and still compete the next day with no problems. Jeff, it sounds like you want to start playing singles with our women's singles player here in Australia. Potentially, but my hip's not really that good anymore, so I might be a bit too slow for, for all the lady singles players out there. I do my best to, to help and coach, but playing the full court is a lot harder than it used to be. Sometimes I get on court and I think, I can't believe I used to cover this court because it is so big. And it doesn't help that I've been playing a lot more doubles, so I'm a bit more used to just covering a small area and having my partner cover me if I can't get it. I think that's completely fair enough if you haven't been spending much time on the court and only playing doubles. So I want to change gears for a moment because you talked about something earlier and I just want to cover it off for those who aren't familiar with the type of process that you were talking about. And you were talking about getting the videos of the opponents that your players would be playing in the future at the tournament. So when you do see these videos or get access to these videos of other players, what are you looking for specifically? How do you, how do you go about looking at a video of an opponent and how do you analyze the opponent's game so that you can utilize it for the benefit of our Australian team? This is a really loaded question because there's definitely not one way to review a video and get tactics from it. I think it does also vary from coach to coach in their background as well. What I've found as a player over my career is that the Asian coaches or the ones that have Asian upbringings, they will look at a video and they'll be quite general in the way that they review it. So they'll look at the video and say, okay, we need to move faster. We need to play off the net or we need to play more on the net. We need to attack this side that kind of stuff. It's very general in nature in terms of the, the game plan. And the rationale behind that I know is because their philosophy is even if we come up with a game plan, 
if the opponent recognizes it, we have to change our game plan anyway. So there's no point being really, really specific about it. Conversely, when you look at, say, a European's way or European's view of analyzing a game, they're a lot more specific in what they're actually looking for. So they're looking for certain patterns. For example, where do they return serve? Where can we serve to? Where can we anticipate a shuttle coming? I'm not saying the Asian coaches don't look at this, but what I've found in my experience is the European coaches are a lot more on the lookout of specific plays and specific areas to actually target rather than more of a general sense. So when I actually review videos, because I've been fortunate enough to be coached by both European and Asian coaches, I feel that I have a little bit of both in me. So one of the first things I'll probably look at is especially for, I'll just use men's singles for example, because that was my event when I was playing full time. One of the main things that I look at is patterns from service, from service situations, especially when they're under pressure. I know that a lot of people will be really aware of the first three shots in doubles, but not as many people will think about it in singles, but there are actually a lot of points to be won within the first few shots in singles if you're serving and anticipating well. So first of all, I'll probably look at habits in terms of service returns and where they're serving it as well. The second thing I'll look at is how they move to each and every corner. So generally speaking, the player will be more comfortable in a certain corner, especially in the rear court, and they'll probably move a little bit slower to a different corner. Of course, if the player is very well rounded, it's hard to be able. It's hard to actually see that there's much difference. But sometimes you can actually see there's a big difference between the way they move and whether they're really aggressive from a corner or they're a little bit more passive from a corner. For example, there was a game plan that I was working on in Switzerland where we found that one of the players that we we're playing against was very passive outside his forehand rear court corner. And so what we found was when we we're in trouble, if we wanted to create opportunities, we'd need to punch it back there in order for us to gain an opportunity to attack. Because if we went too slow to the around the head corner, he could generate a lot of speed, a lot of different shots, and a lot of winners from that corner. So just looking at certain habits that players have and where their strengths and weaknesses are is kind of a, a general outline of how I look at the video as well. And lastly, in terms of the video analysis, we'll look at where they're making errors so if there's a certain corner, they're making errors for some particular reason, whether it's a technical thing, uh, whether they smash straight or cross from each side, what they're more comfortable with. Everyone is more comfortable with a certain shot, no matter who you are. And it's just seeing where they're coming. So where are the winners coming from their racket? Where's their favorite shot to hit winners? Where do they usually make errors from? Where do winners get hit against them? So do they get hit against them because they go to the rear court, then they attack cross quickly because they can't turn quick enough? And that might be a thing with European players. They're generally not as quick in turning their hips compared to the Asian players. Um, tall players, for example, might not be as fast at smashing to the body as uh, people who aren't as tall. And yeah, there are certain traits that you need to look for in every player to see whether we can exploit those things. So I know that it's been a bit of a convoluted answer. And the, the reason for that is, that unfortunately, it's not as simple as just saying, hey, just look at one, two, three, just purely because every player is different. And another thing is that one perspective is never the only the right answer. So when I do the video analysis by myself, and then I, then I ask the player to do the video, video analysis by themselves, and then we come together and compare notes, it's basically always different. There are always going to be some similarities, but there are always a lot of differences. And that's just purely because we're looking for different things. So that's often why I get the player to look at it themselves, because I don't want to say it and then they forget about what they're actually thinking of. It's a really good exercise for them to be able to see what they want to do. And then I can see it because some of the times they'll say, I think this and I think, oh, wow, I didn't actually see that. And let's put that in the game plan because I think that's really important. So. Video analysis is something that's always changing every time you watch a video and what you're looking for. And there's no probably no one way to do it. And every coach will have their own way of that that they think works best for them. Although that you know that you said that sounds like a convoluted way of answering the question, I feel like that actually would have provided our audience with quite a bit of value not just from analyzing videos, but just understanding the overall strategy as a badminton player and the various different 
approaches you can take on determining how to defeat your opponent. Because you're talking specifically about video analysis, it does still tie over and I find that the information that you provided will certainly be of use to badminton players and fans out there as to when they're watching even a game these days, when they, when they go to their social badminton game, if they watch a couple of players playing at the court, they can actually take some of the information that you've provided in the last few minutes in, within your answer and bring that to their own game and share that with, with other players as well. Yeah, I think that's a really important point that you made, Henry, is that when you are watching badminton, there's two ways you can watch it. The first way is you watch it just because you enjoy it, and that's completely fine. You watch the rallies for what they are and think, well, this is awesome, well, they're really good, or no, this is boring. Or you can look at it in a different way and kind of look at it from more of a coach analytical point of view as well. So rather than just watching it point by point, looking at one particular thing. Of course, you can't focus on everything at once, but let's just say for this set that you're watching, let's just focus on every single service return that the player is doing from one side and then you'll start to notice some patterns you will you absolutely will it's just that you're not aware aware of it and you're not focusing on it or you can say hey where did they hit all of their winners from and just mark it down write it down on a piece of paper and then you'll start to see how the match analysis can actually happen and like i said don't try to focus on too many things at once because no one can do that i can't even do that where I look at five different things at once. There's usually one, only one or two focus points where I look at in order to do a match analysis well. Yeah, great. I think that's that's good advice for players and maybe even amateur coaches who want to start coaching players as well because sometimes you get overwhelmed with all of the different shots that you're watching because badminton is such a fast sport. You know, it's it's hard to focus on all the different things Whereas you can just focus on, as you said, you know, how they are returning serve for the first few points or where they, where they take their winners from on court as well, where they make most of their winning, winning shots. So that's really great advice, Jeff. So I know we've talked a bit about the environment that you, you were in, in at the World Championships. Can you tell me a bit about the athletes that, that you saw there? Were there any that you were able to meet that you've always wanted to meet? Did you get to see any of your favorite players play, like our, our common favorite player, Kenta Mota? Yeah, absolutely. In the environment that you're in with the players and all the coaches, you have access to everywhere and everyone. There's basically no restrictions on where you can actually go. So in terms of meeting players, look, it's not something that we usually do just purely because being behind the scenes and being on the training court, the practice court, the warm-up court, it's not really a place where players would appreciate being bothered per se with, say, a photo or meeting new people because they're there to focus on their matches. So I didn't go out and I didn't go and try to meet people or talk to any of the players unless I actually knew them or there was a reason to actually talk to them. I'm not saying that they're unfriendly. It's just that they're focused. They're focused on their match and that's what I expect of them and I wouldn't do anything to take them out of focus. But the environment is unreal in itself because you're literally walking next to the world's best. Kento Momoto was standing literally right next to me while our team was training and Japan was next on our court. So he was there warming up right next to me. You just look around, there's everyone. There's Lin Dan sitting over there or training. There's Tai Su Ying. We were on the court after her, actually. There's everyone. And the amount of matches and badminton that I watched the World Championships was phenomenal as well. I watched so much badminton and I loved every second of it. And just seeing the world's best back on court live and because we get access, we have literally ground floor seats. We can see everything. And yeah, it's just amazing to see it all in real life again so the whole experience being around the top players and just saying hey look there's kento Momoto right next to me there's lindan right next to me that's an awesome feeling in itself but at the same time just making sure that we that i didn't overstep boundaries and make sure that i give them their space for their preparation as they need to there were some players that i knew as well from when i was playing And it was really nice to talk to them, see them, catch up with them. And there are also quite a few coaches that I knew were previous players as well that I was able to meet. And I haven't seen them for a good 10, 11 years, some of them. 
and that was great to reconnect with them as well. So all in all, the experience and the environment in itself was something that really made me miss being a part of it. And I think that got me to thinking that, look, if opportunities arise again to do similar kinds of things with the players, then I think I would definitely take the opportunity. Yeah, great. I'm glad. I'm glad that you think that way, and I hope that you do. And it certainly sounds like a really surreal environment to be around the world's best players, coming from an outside perspective, as I've never been around those kinds of players before, but I'm sure other people would feel the same way. So, Jeff, I want to know, if you could go back there again to Basel or Bale in Switzerland, would you go back as a coach or would you go back as a player? (laughs) Good question. Look, I would always go back as a player if I could. So if my level was high enough, if I was fast enough, if I was injury free and if I could actually compete and make it to the world championships again, that would be awesome to do as a player. At the same time though, there there's a level of satisfaction that does come with coaching that you don't get when you're playing. And it is that satisfaction, that feeling of helping other people and being of service and really contributing to their experience. And look, it's just something that, like I said, if the opportunity comes up again, then I'll definitely take it. So if you ask me player or coach, if I could play and I could be competitive, then I'd love to play, but I'd take coaching any day of the week. Fantastic. So I want to give you this moment to share anything else that you would like to talk about, about the World Championships as well. Is there anything on your mind that you had taken away from the World Championships or just anything that you would like to talk about or feel that our audience would benefit from hearing? I think just in relation to being live, being there live and watching the top matches. So I do keep up with World Badminton. I'm always watching live streaming on YouTube, for example, for all the top tournaments. But being there in person and seeing them in real life was so refreshing and it made me remember what it was really like to be a part of that speed and that athleticism and everything like that and once again i know that i did write a a blog post about this but it just reinforces the fact that tv does not do our sport justice in the way that it actually looks it looks way too slow it looks like the players aren't moving and the shuttle looks slow it looks so easy and it just doesn't convey the power, the speed, the athleticism, the environment, the atmosphere, the excitement, the the sweat dripping off their faces, all that kind of stuff. The intensity of the sport is just not captured as well as it is in real life. And it is something that I'd love to see improve in the sport of badminton. But it just really got me thinking, hey, look, this this is so amazing. Live the live um, the live perspective of badminton is so amazing and I wish that TV would portray it in that same light as well for badminton players, fans, as well as people who don't even know badminton because I do truly, truly believe that if someone was not a badminton player, was actually there watching and watching, say, in the seat next to me where they could see everything basically from eye level and see how fast they move and see how intense it is, I think that they'd fall in love with the sport, even if they didn't even know the ins and outs of it. So something very passionate to my heart is about how amazing badminton actually is live and that TV just does not do it justice. Yes, I completely agree, Jeff. And thank you for finishing on that note. And if you did have any feedback for us, please contact us via our website, on www.volantware.com or via our Facebook and Instagram pages at our Facebook and Instagram handles, Volantware, V-O-L-A-N-T-W-E-A-R. I want to also thank Jeff for coming onto a, our podcast, even though it is our podcast. I was on here already, but it was <laughs> fun to be the person speaking instead of the one always asking the questions. So thanks for having me, Henry. No problems, Jeff. And I'm sure that... 
everyone has taken something valuable out of this podcast. For me personally, and I probably made that obvious in this podcast, that I did really enjoy our Jeff's response, although he thought it was convoluted, I thought it was very lovely, to hear his interpretation on how Asian and European coaches uh, interpret the video analysis of competitors or opponents and how we can use that on a day-to-day basis, whether that be social badminton, competitive badminton, just watching the game. Now, obviously, we don't want to be constantly analysing games that we're watching if we're watching purely for fun, but it is a great way to look at it as well. So I just want to say thank you so much for tuning in to the Badminton Podcast. Look, we'll continue to... push you to grow as a player and as a person and we'll get as many badminton players like yourself on the show as we can to give you their value their tips and their wisdom because i know that there's so much wisdom out there in our community make sure you keep sharing your love for the sport with everyone that you know so that we can show the world how incredible badminton is this podcast was brought to you by volantware the most versatile badminton apparel you'll ever own.